next on Unsolved Mysteries. Tulsa, Boston, Fort Lauderdale. Three cities, three contract killings. What's the connection? For decades, Albert DeSalvo was believed to be the notorious Boston Strangler. But new DNA evidence suggests that at least one of his victims may have been killed by someone else. A Canadian woman has captured these eerie lights on film. She believes they are UFOs, but skeptics are unconvinced. And when a woman is murdered, the police suspect her boyfriend. Now he has mysteriously disappeared, and so has his son. Join us for five cases with twists and turns that you can hardly believe. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Boston, Massachusetts. Today, the city is peaceful. But decades ago, these same streets exploded in horror. The year 1962. The first known serial killer in American history was on the prowl. Victim number one, Anna Slessers, 55, strangled with her bathrobe and raped with a blunt object. Victim number two, Helen Blake, 65. Sexually mutilated and strangled, her bra twisted into an enormous bow under her chin. Victim number three, Nina Nichols, 68. Strangled, her nylons tied into yet another gruesome bow. It was only the beginning. Over the next two years, eight more women fell victim to the psychopath. All but one were choked to death in their own homes, their bodies posed in hideous positions. The city was gripped by fear and paranoia. Then, Albert de Sal, facing a prison term for a series of other rapes, confessed that he was the Boston Strangler. Some believe, however, that de Saville had reason to falsely confess. First day, uh, put my arm around backwards, right? Right. The first thing that Albert hoped to get out of being known as the Boston Strangler was the fame of it, because he desperately wanted to be famous, even if it were something terrible. His second goal was to avoid a prison sentence. He had apparently been convinced that if he confessed to the stranglings, he would be sent not to prison, but to a very fancy private institution where doctors would study him. Do you remember tying any knots in it? Yeah. Many detectives were convinced that he had to be the killer. If he was lying, DeSalvo's confession was incredibly accurate. That makes two. If you had heard him go into detail and tell you exactly how the furniture was, and uh, what it was adjacent to, and so forth. You, 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 you know, nobody could tell you that unless they were there. After eight years of research on this case, one thing I'm certain of, and that is that Albert DeSalvo was not the Boston Strangler. There are a number of very good suspects. None of them happen to be Albert DeSalvo. In November of 1973, Albert DeSalvo called his former psychiatrist from prison. He said that now he was ready to tell the truth about the Boston Strangler. But that same night, DeSalvo was murdered. And now, dramatic new evidence suggests that DeSalvo was not the notorious serial killer. Mary. 
On January 4th, 1964, Mary Sullivan was found by her roommate, strangled to death and sexually assaulted. In a final morbid gesture, placed at her feet was a Happy New Year card. The police collected semen left on Mary's body by the killer. But in 1964, there was no way to match it to a suspect. Albert DeSalvo later admitted he'd killed Mary. But two families have formed a surprising alliance to challenge his confession. The family of Mary Sullivan and the family of Albert DeSalvo. I never believed my brother was the boss of Strangler from day one. I just want the name cleared. That's all. Uh, Albert was not perfect. Albert did some bad things. Albert was not a murderer. Mary Sullivan's sister, Diane, also believes that DeSalvo was not the killer. I mainly come here to say hi to Mary, and um, I'm going to try to do my what I can. I'm going to do everything I can to find her murderer. To the DeSalvo and Sullivan families, there was a clear solution to the controversy, DNA profiling. I made several inquiries to the Boston Police Department, and they told me flat out that they did not have any physical evidence left in the Boston Strangler case to test for DNA evidence. So Mary Sullivan's family turned to the only evidence available to them, Mary's remains. We had to do the exhumation of my aunt's body. It was a horrible experience. We didn't want to do it, but it was our last and only recourse, we thought, and it was the only chance to find her killer. The Sullivans got help from a team of forensic experts. We were obviously looking for any seminal fluid. And we do know that seminal fluid will fluoresce under UV light. So we looked and seminal fluid fluoresce. And it also was in the right location for seminal fluid. It's on pubic hair. So we examined that and went after that as far as could we get any DNA from it. We had to be extra careful because obviously her hair is going to have her DNA in it. So one of the tricky parts becomes isolating DNA only from this material that's stuck in the pubic hair and not from the hair itself. Dr. Ferran successfully isolated a DNA sequence and compared it to Albert DeSalvo's genes by using DNA taken from his brother, Richard. The results were virtually indisputable. The semen was not Albert DeSalvo's. When he said that there was DNA, they believed from Mary's killer on her body, and that DNA didn't match Albert DeSalvo, it was just complete vindication as far as I was concerned. For those who say that Albert DeSalvo did do it, it, the shoe is on their foot now. It's for them to come forward and show the evidence to prove that Albert DeSalvo did do it. But if DeSalvo did not kill Mary Sullivan, then who did? The detectives who first investigated the killing found a strange piece of evidence in her bathroom, and it implicated Mary's abusive ex-boyfriend. They found an ascot uh, cut up in the toilet. When my sister dated this person, that's all she bought him for presents. He loved ascots. So I could see him definitely cutting that ascot up in the bathroom, and I could absolutely see him killing Mary. Another suspect emerged based on an eyewitness account. A neighbor saw a man in Mary's apartment at the approximate time of the murder. Mary's roommate had a boyfriend who matched the neighbor's description. He may have had access to Mary's apartment, explaining why there were no signs of forced entry. What are these for? They're the keys to the apartment. Next your set. I'm gonna go pat on my nose. Go. Right. Her apartment key had gone missing the day before she was killed. Now this key hadn't fallen off the keychain, it was taken off. Do you live in Vermont? The suspect was no. brought in for a polygraph test. According to the police, his responses were deemed untruthful. Once DeSalvo had confessed, however, 
Investigations into the suspect and Mary's ex-boyfriend were closed. Did you kill Mary Sullivan? No. Face front, please. The police also had strong suspects in several of the other murders. If Albert wasn't the Boston Strangler, who was the Boston Strangler? From what my research indicates, there wasn't one. There were many. On June 14th, 1962, the Strangler claimed his first victim, 56-year-old Anna Slessers. Earlier that day, a painting crew was working at her apartment. 16 days later, the same painting crew arrived at the apartment building of Helen Blake. She became victim number two. Two of the members of the painting crew, their alibis couldn't be corroborated by their boss or by their uh, fellow workers. And that's an unusual connection. Victim number seven was 23-year-old Patricia Bissett. In this case, police also had a strong suspect. Patricia? Patricia's boss, the man who discovered her body. The detectives found out that Patricia Bissett was having an affair with her happily married boss at the time she was killed. Well, I found her autopsy report. It shows that she was one month pregnant when she was murdered. Not only do you have motive, but you have a suspect there. But investigation of all the other suspects stopped cold when Albert DeSalvo confessed. But many still believed the confession was bogus. There's a possibility that some of the older women died at the hands of the same person. Each of the young women who died was murdered by a different individual who had his own motives. If you hated a woman back in the early 1960s, you could kill her, loosely wrap a stocking around her neck, and hope that the police would think it was the Boston Strangler. All the grisly details were printed in the papers at the time. If you wanted to commit a murder, here was your diagram. The Sullivan family continues to hope that Mary's killer will one day be identified and prosecuted. I want closure from my mother. My mother has had to live without any answers in this case. We want to publicly identify Mary's killer, look him in the eye, and, and tell him what, what he stole from us. When Albert DeSalvo was murdered in prison, the truth about the Boston Strangler may have died with him. He had told his psychiatrist that he would tell the real story the next day. But the families of some of the victims are still searching for the truth. They do not believe that the real story has ever been told. Update. There are new developments in this case, and here's one of our staff with details. In 2013, Albert DeSalvo's body was exhumed. Recent developments in DNA testing have shown an indisputable link of DeSalvo to the death of Mary Sullivan, believed to be the Strangler's last victim. Authorities said that the odds that a white male other than DeSalvo contributed to the crime scene are 220 billion to one, and that this is definite proof that Albert DeSalvo was indeed the Boston Strangler in the case of Mary Sullivan. Coming up, a woman claims that she communicated with bizarre lights in the Canadian sky. Could they be UFOs? Vancouver, British Columbia. For many years, this city has had a high number of UFO sightings. The most frequent and well-documented have been attributed to one woman. I had a sensation that something was watching me. So I went over to the window and here was this enormous object sitting up in the sky. It was so beautiful to look at. I wasn't afraid at all, you know. I, was, I felt really privileged to be able to see something like that. Dorothy's husband and children did not take her seriously. She was determined to prove that what she had seen was not simply a star, 
or an airplane. I said, I must find some way of communicating with this thing up there. So I picked up a flashlight and flashed the light three times to the left, and this object went three times to the left. Then I flashed it three times to the right, and the object went three times to the right. So I said, I'm not imagining this. I said, this is really happening, so it's intelligent. Dorothy decided to try to capture the UFOs on film. The results were startling. What I saw in the sky was just round objects of light, round balls of light. But what was on the film, you see the balls of light, but after a couple of frames, there will be this enormous blast of light. Dorothy moved the film back and forth until she isolated a single bright frame. But what had first appeared to be a simple flash of light was actually a maze of colored streaks. Strangely, the light did not spill over onto any other frames. I noticed that while I'm filming these objects, they'll suddenly stop and then I'll notice one object like uh, shooting out a little beam at the other object and, and that object will be shooting out a little beam back at it and sort of, uh, I guess it must be messages or something that they're passing back and forth on these beams of light. Dorothy had the single frames of film blown up into photographs. Bright kinetic beams shot out in all directions. She also blew up frames of the mysterious balls of light. These photographs began to show more and more amazing details. Sometimes they'll beam the light down at me, and I'll be all lit up with this light. I used to ask them to come closer and closer because I wanted better shots. And they did, you know, like come closer and closer. I don't think she's lying about what she's doing. I feel that she's quite sincere. On the other hand, I am not able to assess her, uh, her photographs uh, professionally because that's not part of my expertise. But her personality makeup would make me believe that she's not making things up. Bottom line, what is the truth about Dorothy's photographs? Like as in most UFO cases, Dorothy's sightings and her photographs seem to defy conventional logic. She says that she used three different cameras and each one yielded similar results. We asked a photography expert to evaluate Dorothy's film. I have seen several similar examples of photography like this. Light sources in the sky with dark backgrounds are quite easy to manipulate. But these are more extraordinary in the sense that they were done with an 8 millimeter camera, a motion picture camera rather than a still camera, and they have so many different types of effects. Dorothy Isaac became well known in the UFO community. One day, a businessman named Jerry Mackay came to visit, hoping to learn more about her sightings. And these are like daytime type shots. Try and get some pictures in the daytime as well, and that's why I got these. I was listening very intently to what she was saying, at which time I noticed that I was hearing some kind of audible sensing thing that was happening only in my right ear. They know it's solid and it's not just uh, excuse me dorothy I, I don't mean to interrupt you but i'm getting a strange sensation in my ear here you can hear that and i looked at her and i said yes i can what is it and this brilliant beam of smile went from ear to ear on her face and i remember the look that she gave me and she said they're here jerry mckay was the first person to say that he actually heard the same thing that Dorothy heard. To my complete shock and amazement, what appeared to be sitting right out in front of the window just to our left was a hard metallic object. And as soon as it disappeared, Dorothy let out a giggle that was like, there you go. What do you think of that? Jerry commissioned an artist to draw what he and Dorothy had seen. I feel there is some sort of message in there for us. They're trying to tell us something from these pictures. My mission is to um, 
just keep filming, I guess, and uh, receiving these pictures for as long as I am able to, and hope that one day someone or somewhere will be able to understand what it's all about. Next, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a wealthy businessman is gunned down in the parking lot of his country club. Why are authorities calling it the highlight hit? Our next story is about three murders in three different cities, thousands of miles apart. Most would say they were unrelated. But authorities were convinced that the killings were all connected to gambling on the sport of highlight. In the early 80s, highlight was big business and big betting. Now played only in Florida, it was once legal in four states where $700 million was bet on the sport each year. Three years before his death, Oklahoma businessman Roger Wheeler purchased World Highlight, which operated arenas in Florida and Connecticut. On a spring afternoon, two men drove into the Southern Hills Country Club, parked near Wheeler's Cadillac, and waited for him to finish his golf game. My father never expressed concern to me that his life might be in danger. I've often wondered what he might have known, if anything but no one knows if there was any words said at all. One of the men walked up to Wheeler's car and shot him point blank in the face. Witnesses said the assailant concealed his handgun in a towel and paper bag as he calmly walked across the parking lot. At the crime scene, detectives found four unspent bullets from the killer's gun near Wheeler's body. They may have been left behind as a signature or a warning from Wheeler's killers. I feel the people that murdered my father are obviously very intelligent, they're very cunning, they're very calculating. Well, the one thing that they cannot stand is publicity. They cannot stand the pressure of people knowing who they are and what they are and the thought that somebody might talk. A year later, a second execution-style murder, this time in Boston. The target was Brian Halloran, a reputed underworld figure. Before he died, Halloran told the FBI that he had been offered the contract on Roger Wheeler, but he had turned it down. Halloran claimed that a man named John Callahan ordered the hit on Wheeler. Callahan had been the president of World Highlight before it was purchased by Wheeler. However, Callahan was forced to resign because of reported links to organized crime. Callahan indicated that he was going to lose a lot of money if Wheeler wasn't eliminated, implying that he still had some connection to Highlight. One evening, Brian Halloran and a friend left the Boston restaurant for a six o'clock meeting. Outside, three men waited in a dark colored sedan. What is it? The driver of the car was killed instantly. The car rolled across the street and Halloran, still alive, tried to make it back to the restaurant. Brian Halloran had substantial information, truthful information, that was in line with the way Mr. Wheeler was killed. It's too big of a coincidence to lay it off as only a coincidence. We feel that the two are definitely connected. South Florida, three months later, John Callahan flew to Fort Lauderdale. Though he lived in Boston, he kept a condominium and a leased Cadillac in the area. Eight hours after he arrived, Callahan's car was parked at the Miami airport. Three days later, 
a foul odor coming from the trunk caused the parking attendant to call the police. Inside the trunk was Callahan's body. By no means was it an amateur job. It was extremely professional. It's very easy for these people to commit murder and get away with it. They know every step of the way, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. It just becomes second nature to them. They do it and they walk away. No problems. Callahan died of multiple gunshot wounds. His car had been washed, vacuumed, and wiped clean, so the only evidence on the scene was the body itself and several unspent bullets found in the trunk. Anything else you want on this one? It is our belief that all three homicides are connected. The homicide of Mr. Wheeler in Tulsa, the homicide of Mr. Halloran in Boston, and the homicide of Mr. Callahan here in Miami. There are little bits and pieces of information, evidence that link the three together. And it all seems to tie back to their dealings with World Highlight. John Callahan had been forced to resign as president of World Highlight because of his links to known underworld figures. Roger Wheeler purchased the company two years later. At the time, he received a letter warning him, if you knew what was going on behind the scenes, you would not be involved. If I were you, I would get out quick. Wheeler ignored that warning. When my father was shot, one of his friends said that this type of murder is never solved. And I just can't accept that. I cannot bury my father until his killers are brought to justice. All it would take is just one person to come forward with a little bit more information, and we can break this case. Update. There have been several important developments in this case. A government informant identified John Vincent Martirano as a suspect. Martirano pleaded guilty to being the trigger man in the killing of both Roger Wheeler and John Callahan. John Martirano ultimately pleaded guilty to 10 murders, but because he helped the FBI prosecute other mafia members, he was given a reduced sentence. He was released from prison after serving only 12 years. Two leaders of Boston's Winter Hill Gang, James Whitey Bulger and Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy, were also charged in the Wheeler and Callahan hits. In addition, a former FBI agent named Paul Rico was linked to the Wheeler killing case, but died before he could be put on trial. Flemmy is in prison for life. Bulger was also wanted in the murder of Brian Halloran, and since we broadcast this case after years on the run, James Whitey Bulger has been captured. He was later convicted and sent to prison. Next, a Texas man accused of killing his girlfriend takes off with his nine-year-old son. Lockhart, Texas. Jack White is worried when he arrives at his daughter's house. Latricia White, a 38-year-old nurse, hasn't been seen or heard from in almost 24 hours. Everyone was concerned about Latricia because she just hadn't gone to work Monday. And she never, never fails to go to work or at least call. Trish? I just called her, and then, then I went over and felt her. I knew that, that she was dead. Latricia White had been shot six times in the head with a 22 caliber weapon. Her death stunned her friends and neighbors. She left behind two children and a lot of unanswered questions. Investigators were puzzled. Despite the violent nature of the crime, there were no signs of a struggle and nothing in her house had been disturbed. 
Got some blood here. Looks like it's going into the kitchen area, Paul. Just as puzzling was the disappearance of Latricia's live-in boyfriend, Lee Walkerhagen, a local trucker nicknamed Dub. Also missing was Dub's nine-year-old son, Chance, who had been visiting for the holidays. The fact that her boyfriend, Dub Walker Hagen, could not be found led us to, to several different areas to investigate. Number one, uh, is he a suspect? Could he have committed this crime? The other one is, or is he a victim? Has he also been injured? Three days later, Dub's pickup truck was found abandoned in Austin, Texas, about 30 miles from the crime scene. In the truck, investigators found Dub's hunting rifle, which had not been fired, his checkbook, and his wallet. In back, a toolbox, a spare tire, and Christmas gifts still unopened, but all streaked with blood. Initially in the investigation, we felt that this blood could have come from our victim. That was later ruled out. Uh, the blood type was not the same as our victim, so we feel like that someone else was injured uh, not seriously, but someone else was injured. Could that someone else have been Dub or Chance? The question could not be answered. All of the blood tests were inconclusive. The police and the White family believe that Dub murdered Latricia in a jealous rage. But Dub's family and friends are convinced that he and Chance also met with foul play. It's been going on 11 months now, and we haven't heard anything from him at all. And that tells me if, he, if we haven't heard from him, then he's got to be dead. I don't know who did it. I just know that he, that he couldn't, have, couldn't have done it and then just disappeared off the face of the earth. To the police, however, Dub was the obvious suspect especially after they began to take a close look at his relationship with Latricia. Hi, guys. Hi, Trish. Where the hell were you last night? According to Latricia's family, Dub was extremely jealous and suspicious. I wish that in the future, if you're going to be late, would you please give me a call and let me know, or try to be home on time. I saw that he was a good man when I met him, and when I left him, I was scared to death of him. He had a temper. He treated my oldest boy terribly, and I was scared. Dub's son, Chance, was often the focus of their arguments. He's only nine years old. What do you expect? Excuse me, Chance. It's not your fault. Your father raised you to be a spoiled brat. Brat? He's my son. He's not yours. And you have no right. You understand me? Well, it's my house. Dub packed his bags and threatened to leave. I'm tired of your threats. You don't have the guts to leave. Just three nights later, Dub, Chance, and Latricia were seen enjoying themselves at a local restaurant. The incident was apparently forgotten. But late the very next day, Latricia's father found her shot to death in her bedroom. Dub and Chance had disappeared. Three days later, Dub was formally charged with first-degree murder. Four months passed with no sign of Dub or Chance. And then, at the house of Chance's maternal grandfather... Nello! Help me! Help me! All he said was, help me. And then the phone was jerked out of his hand and slammed down. And uh, I looked over at my wife and I said, that was Chance. Could the plea for help actually have been from chance? Dub's family is convinced that the answer is no. They believe that the phone call was a hoax and that Dub and Chance were murdered. But Trisha's family and the police believe that Dub is a killer and that he is still very much alive. Update. There are new developments in this case, and here's one of our staff with details. The Texas State Department of Public Safety announced recently that investigators now have evidence that Dub Walkerhagen and his son, Chance, were also victims of foul play. 
It is now believed that this was a crime of passion by someone closely associated with the family. We will bring you more information as the investigation proceeds. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, when a man dies, no one notices for an entire year, and no one claims the small fortune that he left behind. McCormick, South Carolina. Walter Rice lived alone in a modest trailer. He was a reclusive man. No one came calling, and he liked it that way. Walter Rice was quite a mystery man. And he kept to himself. He didn't, he didn't have anything to do with his neighbors. He never ventured out to meet any of his neighbors. Walter took a cab home one day after his own car had been wrecked in a traffic accident. Sometime during the next week, he suffered a heart attack and died before he could call for help. Incredibly, a full year passed before Walter's body was even discovered. The power company and the cable TV company turned off service to his trailer. Eventually, the post office stamped his mail returned to sender. It was two strangers who finally found Walter's body two strangers who weren't exactly making a social call. Two people attempted to break into the trailer. They uh, broke in the front window and then went around to the back door, and his body was laying right at the back door. They were frightened away after finding his body, and uh, sometime later, now this could be a month or two later, they got a girlfriend of one of the people who attempted to break in to call the police department to notify them that there was a dead body in the trailer on, on Oak Street. Walter Rice was 73 when he passed away. Probate judge Ronnie Kidd took on the task of sorting through his possessions. I started looking through his papers, all of his effects in his trailer. Initially, I didn't expect to find any anything of value. But after searching through Walter Rice's personal effects papers, bank papers. I found him to have an estate of approximately $140,000. $140,000. The judge began to piece together the few known facts of Walter's life. Pay stubs showed that for 10 years, he worked as a cook at the Griswold Inn near Essex, Connecticut. Walter Rice also had a passport. It's stamped with visas from Curacao, Jamaica, Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and Guatemala. But nothing is known about Walter's travels outside of the United States. After three years of searching, no heirs were found, and Walter Rice's assets were liquidated. The money went to the state of South Carolina. If there had been any surviving relatives, they waited too long to make a claim. But if any of them is watching, at least they'll know what happened to Mr. Walter Rice. On a recent broadcast, we profiled a fugitive named Jim Burnside. He was wanted for the vicious murder of his wife, Annette Schaubacher. Getting off work now? Yeah, I'm gonna go home in a few minutes. It didn't look like trouble at the start. They worked together at a grocery store. She was a checker and he was a butcher. However, she was only 18 years old when she married Jim. When the honeymoon ended, the abuse began. She became afraid of him almost immediately because he was jealous of her and he started telling her right from the beginning that he would kill her if she ever tried to leave him. It took five years, but Annette finally worked up the courage to walk out. Two months later, Jim Burnside struck back. It's Jim. He found Annette alone with one of her co-workers. Hey. 
Get over here. What are you doing? Annette's co-worker survived the attack. Annette died at the scene. She had been stabbed 15 times with a butcher knife. By that afternoon, Burnside was on the run. It's bad enough knowing that Annette had to die, but to know that he is still out there, it, it's horrible. We just want him caught. Update. The night this story aired, we received calls from two viewers from Shelby County, Alabama. They recognized Jim Burnside, but they knew him as Al Wilson. When I saw his actual picture, I just looked at my husband and I just started pointing and I'm going, you know, tell me my eyes aren't deceiving me. You know, that is Al. And he goes, yes, that's Al. The next morning, FBI agents and sheriff's deputies converged on a flea market where Burnside worked. Uh, how you doing, BR? When Burnside saw them, he took off. FBI! Oh! FBI! Hold it! The fugitive pulled out a gun and took aim. Put the gun down! Put the gun down! Burnside was shot twice. He was arrested and then hospitalized. From what we've been able to determine, talking to his co-workers, he had made a statement on Thursday morning that he had anticipated having problems that day. So apparently he had viewed the um, Unsolved Mysteries himself Wednesday night. James Burnside recovered from his wounds. He pleaded no contest to first-degree murder and attempted first-degree murder. He is now serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. If you have any information about other cases we have profiled, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.